You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Coming up on the brew session, Leyline Binding may be the most powerful removal since Swords to Plowshares, while Shadow Prophecy is more powerful than Factor Fiction at an even cheaper mana cost. Will these domain cards break into the top tier of modern? There's only one way to find out, so let's roll up our sleeves and start to brew. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Schriever, also known as Cave Dan Online. I'm joined today all the way from Buenos Aires, Argentina. You know him as Mord to Light. It's Emmy Sagasti. Emmy, welcome. Hey, yo. Hey, Dan. Glad to be here with you again after you have... You forgot the keys to the basement inside, so I was able to sneak out for the last couple of days. But it's nice to actually be let out into the light for once. Like, within the terms of my agreement. <laughs> How is it going? I'm surviving. It's been complete chaos uh, for me the last week or so. I'm in the middle of a cross-country slash international move. So I spent the last four or five days taking all of my earthly possessions and putting them into boxes, shoving that all into one of those pod storage containers where you know they drop it off at your house and you just cram everything you own into it. <laughs> eventually they come and carry it away and you just hope that it shows up on the other side but the complicating factor is that i'm moving overseas for four months first so my wife and i are going to jerusalem from basically this weekend until the end of december and then after that we're going to texas where we hope our stuff will show up but it's just been complete chaos so it did all that packing Somewhat sadly, you know, I had to take our cats and drive them to New York, a whole separate trip, because my cousin is going to be watching them while we're gone, so I'm very sad about that. No kitties right now. Hmm. Talking about kitties, so right now the kitties are asleep, but just wait a few minutes, and all of a sudden when I see one of them pouring their head up, I'm going to grab a tiny bitty kitty from Eddie's and put it into a microphone, and you're going to hear the soft wailing of a tiny mole rat. Yeah, man, you got some big news. You're a proud cat grandpa <laughs> now. I can't believe you have like these tiny kitties in front of you right now. The, the previous 15 minutes before we started the podcast was me showing Dan just straight up footage of the four kittens sleeping next to Eddie's. It's an absolutely adorable image. And they're just so, so darn cute. We have a bet going with Dan that says I'm not going to be able to give away most of them. I have a fight going with my partner where I say I should give away all of them and she says we should keep one. So I'm in a losing fight in every single axis about them. Yeah, my guess is that you'll end up keeping three of the four kittens because they're so young right now. Even if you find someone to adopt them, you can't actually like send them to their new home for another what a month or so, is that right? Yeah, literally 35 more days around that time before they're actually able to be without the mother. Because before that, they have to, like, rely on her completely. And I'm also expecting the moment, because theoretically, in around two weeks, Eris is going to start randomly grabbing a kitten and dropping it on me. <laughs> because she just gets exhausted of it, and now the kitten can survive without her, so she just gets bored of them and drops it on, like, their owner or something, so she can go be her for some hours. And make sure she's with someone she trusts. So the, literally, the cat just drops the kittens on you. That's going to be so cute. See, that's going to happen. And then you're going to be like, okay, we can't. Once the first person comes to adopt the first kitten, you're going to be like, okay, we're keeping the rest of them. We're so sad that it's leaving. <laughs> that's what happened. Like, I adopted one of my cats. I adopted from my aunt and uncle under very similar circumstances. They had brought in like a stray mother who had three kittens and they were, you know, talking a big game, like, oh, we're just fostering, you know, we're definitely going to rehome them. Everyone say to that. I'm like, you're not going to rehome them. I, I jumped on that so fast because I'm like, if I don't act right now, 
they're not going to want to give them away. And sure enough, like, you know, so I, I called my uncle immediately and I was like, yes, I want that black kitten, please. I want that one. By the time I got to pick it up, you know, he was so sad when I took it away. <laughs> no! <laughs> and they kept the other two and they named their <laughs> other two cats after the one that we took away. <laughs> so. But see, they're so chaotic. Look, like, what, that looks like a, just a head. Oh my gosh. I don't know where the rest of that body is. Yeah, this podcast is canceled. We're we're just gonna just have a kitten cam from now on. This is so cute. This is They're the kitty cam. Little... It's like a tiny head. Oh my gosh! See, and some of them start like try to climb, and they just collapse like, a few minutes later because they're not able to walk. Still, like straight up, they just give like three, four steps and go back to where they belong. That's so cute. <sighs> Alright, I gotta focus on magic. I gotta clear my head. Wait a second, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal a cat so we can do it now. Because I, <laughs> I have to do that. <laughs> I should also mention on a serious note, if you adopt cats, just double check that they're spayed or neutered. Like Emmy's cats were theoretically spayed and neutered. It turns out they weren't. And then one day the kittens appeared. <laughs> so it is important. Oh my gosh. Hello. Who is this? This is this is three. They just have numbers? This is number three? Her number yeah. three is a natural podcaster. The, the best part is, once they start making that cry, Eris just looks at me like, give it back. But she trusts me. Er Eris is the mother cat, for Eris context. is the mother cat. <laughs> yeah, so she just looks at me like, give it back. Give back the baby. Or when they cry and she's like not in the same room because like my partner takes one to the room or whatever, she goes, she checks, sees it's fine and returns to the box. Oh my gosh. Okay. We're going to have to have another another kitten do like the intro and outro. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're numbered because my girlfriend tricked me because I keep say I said she's not able to name them. Because, well, yeah. for good reasons, because I, I want to give them away, at least most of them. And she tricked me into like numbering them based on... The order in which they came out, right? Exactly. So the number one, and they have like small showings of that. Like number one has white dot on the back. Number two has two white dots. Number three has no markings of any kind. And number four has a white tip in the tail. Oh my gosh, this, this is so cute. So like they have okay. tiny, <laughs> tiny ways to see them. Well... If you haven't figured it out by now, both Emmy and myself are big cat ladies at heart. So <laughs> the podcast might very well devolve into that, but we do have a magic <laughs> agenda planned for today. Exactly. That's not cat based. In fact, it's a timely one. It's very exciting. Dominaria United, you know, this is the day, but also these kitties were born and that's also extremely important. All right. Got to focus. Focus on the cards, not the cats. <laughs> Focus on the cats. <laughs> We're talking about our first card of the season for Dominaria United. Probably no surprise, it's Leyline Binding. This is a card that Mord and I were talking up even before it was previewed officially. <laughs> yes! It's a part of the uh, official, unofficial leak where Wizards accidentally published their release notes a few days ahead of time. So we talked about this, we kind of broke our own rules slightly because we were just so excited about this card. We put that episode out there. And like immediately a couple of people like replied and were like, I, I can't find this card anywhere. Are you sure it's real? Like it, it sounds too powerful. It sounds like you got tricked by custom magic or something. <laughs> Cause like this card is not officially out there. And also it just sounds like not a real card. And I'm like, yeah, I know what you mean, but it is a real card we think. And it, yeah, it turns out it is a real card. This one's busted. <laughs> like this could really easily be a custom magic card. One of the well-designed ones, but Quite clearly could have been. I mean, it's extremely pushed. It's just like, they didn't have to give it Flash, for example. They had to give it Flash. We would have been talking about it if they hadn't given it Flash. But they did. Well, okay, so they didn't have to. They could have made it like a fine standard card uh, by not giving it Flash. But they want there to be support for Domain, so they gave it Flash. Now it's like the greatest removal spell of all time or something. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to make some ballsy takes on this episode. I don't know if I'm ever going to top March of the Other Worldly Lights is strictly better spreading seas as something completely out of the cahoots, but I like some. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we're going to be brewing with leyline binding. Uh, we've got a bunch of different concepts. We're starting in modern because that's more speciality. We're going to look a little bit of pioneer, but when David is back next week, um, I'm sure he'll have a little more testing under his belt with some pioneer versions. We have a couple sketches in pioneer as well, but uh, this would be primarily focused on modern where it's much easier to assemble the five color mana base. So that's our main agenda for today. Before we jump into all that, just a quick reminder, a little housekeeping that if you enjoy the show, want to help support what we do, the best way to do that is by joining our Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. Join at any tier you're comfortable with. You get access to our wonderful Discord community, as well as other perks. We have an ongoing monthly project where you can nominate cards. You can vote for cards. The current project is Resurgent Belief. And I got to say, Leyline Binding is an amazing upgrade for Resurgent Belief. Yeah, and also the other card we're super excited about. So a lot of Dominaria spices for Resurgent Belief. Yeah, exactly. So I think we'll be uh, recording soon our kind of wrap-up project for Resurgent Belief, and then it's time to put another card up to the vote. So if you want to get in on that, we would love to have you in the Patreon as well. We do have four new patrons we'd like to welcome to the Faithless family this week. They are Alberto M., Chris R., Mitchell S., and Hinahara. Thank you very, very much to those individuals for joining the Patreon. Hinahara... It's like an old acquaintance of mine, also used to be a huge supporter of mine, so thanks a lot. And we also have a note here from Chris saying, I joined solely because of your guys' hard work, and also Emmy joking about Grixis Boomer players being 95 years old. I do what I must. (laughs) Like, yeah, it it cuts. It cuts deeply, but where's the lie? You can't find it. (laughs) Address the lie. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, so with that out of the way, shall we talk about Leyline Binding? Why don't you read the card? I'm going to go ahead. One of the likely the best cards from Dominaria United, at least for modern players, Leyline Binding, 5 and a white for a 6-man enchantment with Flash. Domain, this spell costs 1 less to cast for each basic land type among lands to control. When Leyline Binding enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Binding leaves the battlefield. Here we have it, the one mana Flash Oblivion Ring. Right. So it's five and a white. Mana value is always going to be six, but it's cost reduction. Cost reduction is one of the most dangerous mechanics in the game. Uh, I guess free spells would be the other <laughs> most dangerous mechanic, but anytime you're cheating on mana, this is an effect worth much more than one mana, right? This is probably a four mana effect. We know, at, we know at 4 mana, even with cycling, this is close to unplayable. On 3 mana with flash is where I think this would start into the consideration of modern playable, and on 2 mana, I think this would be a slam dunk. Like at 4 mana, we know it just doesn't see play, even if it has cycling. So you're saying cast out has shown that 4 mana is not enough for constructed. Exactly, because it even has the upside of cycling, which is a pretty reliable upside to increasing the mana by 1, and still it doesn't see any play. On 3 mana it would be interesting, like I don't think it will see play because Oblivion Ring is like nowhere near my realm of playable possibilities. Like I just skipped so far ahead of Oblivion sure. Ring already. Sure. But on 2 mana, I think this would see a lot of play. And that's exactly why it's here. <laughs> yeah. So 2 mana, it'd be very, very good. And then you can get it for 1 mana if you're willing to work for it. And at 1 mana, it's just insane. Yeah. So... The way that I evaluate cards like this is I, I try to imagine the best case scenario. How powerful is the best case scenario? Often trying to figure out, you know, if the best case scenario is still not even playable, then we can just throw the card away. But sometimes the best case scenario is so insanely good that we just have to, like, hmm. ask the question, right? Okay, how, how much do we have to work for that? What are the fail states? What are the intermediate states? And Leyline Binding seems to pass almost all of these tests. You don't have to work that hard, especially in a fetch land format, especially now that Triomes are here. The fail states, paying two or three, are not that bad. Um, although there's a separate fail state of like, okay, you get Blood Moon or something like that. But that's like yeah, a separate question. However, even with the fail safe status, you can still hard cast it. Six mana is something that's bound to happen in a lot of games of modern. And it's not going to be six, it's going to be four, assuming you have a planes. Like, if you can cast this, it's going to be four. 
Okay, so you're saying that even if they Blood Moon me, Leyline Binding is my answer to Blood Moon, and I'm already playing four of it. I mean, it's a, it, it goes the same as March. Yeah. Okay, so maybe there isn't a Blood Moon problem. That's, I mean, that's a great point. I was a little bit worried about Blood Moon, but maybe there's nothing to fear. <laughs> it's annoying in the fact it's going to take you four mana, but it's going to take you four mana at instant speed, and it's exactly the same amount of mana March as the other worldly lads is going to ask for you. Yeah, and they spent three mana and an important turn on the Blood Moon, so like they're they're not going to tempo you out most likely. Yeah. and on decks like Asodius, where like the Blood Moon is, up, you always have like one place and one island, one place and one island, but the Blood Moon is destroying you because of like the triple blue. This can still be three mana a lot of the time, which is better than March, and even better than ending on raid. So the one tricky thing about Blood Moon, just to keep this in mind, I think you'll only make this mistake once, is if they put the Blood Moon onto the stack. Right, you cannot cast Leyline Binding for one to destroy that Blood Moon. Right, you can respond by playing Leyline Binding; it'll come into play, but the Blood Moon will not be in play yet. So that doesn't help you. Alternately, if you let the Blood Moon resolve, suddenly your Leyline Binding no longer costs one. So in that sense, like it doesn't function as a counter spell. It doesn't. It kind of loses this flashiness against Blood Moon, if that makes sense. Yeah. But you know that's okay. You just fetch your planes in response. Go to your next turn. And treat this like a regular removal over a one mana answer for it, which would just be insane. Yeah. Uh, other than that, it's a pretty straightforward card. It does have the restriction of non land permanence, so you can't get Urza Saga, for example. Only your opponent's stuff, so you can't like loop your own, or you can't target your own stuff if you want to do that for some reason. You can do the three ley line binding trick. Exactly. <laughs> And it uses the until templating, which is pretty standard these days, but it's not like Fiend Hunter where you can, like, you know, in response to this trigger or that trigger, um, there's only the one trigger. Yeah, there's no flicker wisping this with a vial to get two stuff. There's no sacrificing it in response with anything. It's just straight up the new set of Oblivion Rings. Also, Shocks and Triumphs do add to your domain. And remember, Waste is not a basic land type. Right, there's only five basic land types so far. Yeah, and there's cloud in the memes of Mystery Boosters. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Mystery Booster literally has a land type, which is cloud. It has literally zero upside, but being a domain type of land. <laughs> it was something they fiddled with in like the early 2010s. Right, right. The cave, I think it was called in one of the great designer search. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that was interesting. Just a way to develop a domain, but yeah, remember, it's not a basic land type. All right, so some important big picture questions that we got to answer before we like dive into building with Leyline Binding. So the first one is deciding whether Leyline is even worth it to build around, because you do have to do a little bit of work to set it up. So cost-benefit analysis, how does Leyline compare to other removal options? What do you think about this, Emmy? So I think this compares extremely well. Like I'm not trying to look at the five cost reduction on the early turns because... I just think that's unreliable, getting two Triumphs. It's like casting turn two Sion of Draco. We know that's like really heavy on your mana. But I'm assuming this is a two drop in the early game and a one drop in the late game. Most of the time. Mm -hmm. That's fair. So let's say I take like four color, which is really common that it just goes turn one tap land, turn one Triumph on your end step. is able to go turn one Triumph, turn two shock land. And let's say they don't get any black triumphs. They're actually playing their mana base as it should. Turn one, Sheskai Triumph into Temple Garden Go. Or Reading Pool Go, so you're also holding up Counter Spell. Immediately, this is a two mana instant speed removal. Which is on par with literally nothing. It's an upgrade over literally anything. In that scenario. Like a super terminate, but it gets any permanent. Exactly. It exiles it. It exiles it. Like, the only similar thing we have nowadays to that is Unholy Hit, which 6 damage is almost killing anything that it can kill. I mean, almost, but then you think about, I mean, why is Murktide so powerful? Exactly. Well, part of the reason is because it survives Unholy Heat. It's very hard to kill. But also the fact, this gets artifacts and enchantments and Sigarda Seid and Hammer and the myriad of other stuff and Holy Heat won't hit. I mean, you can take out a Sigarda's Aid without losing any tempo. Exactly. A one for one, you spent a white, they spent a white. And the thing is, if your opponent doesn't force your removal, like I see this line coming up a lot, you go turn one triumph, turn two, you unholy hit something, get another triumph, and on turn three you're holding up binding plus counter spell. 
I mean, they flash in the Colossus hammer, you flash in the binding, take out the cigar to Zade, the hammer comes in and doesn't attach. I mean, it's like you two for one them. Yeah. Wrecked their whole game. I mean, it's flash. It's so insane that it's at flash speed. The flash makes it so... The biggest weakness of these O-ring effects, it's not when they get destroyed, because at least you're trading one for one. The only annoying card for this will be Bosatio, which might see a bit of a huge resurgence. But... The only way to trade with these is not bouncing. Generally, you just bounce all rings, lead your opponent's turn as a sorcery for them to recast as three. In the mid to late game, bouncing this is a one mana tempo play. Yeah. It's not particularly efficient. I mean, it's so cheap to recast that I think that a, a deck like Four Color would just want to bounce it themselves. Like you'd use Teferi to bounce your only line and cast it on something else. Yeah. Like, once Ragavan is no longer a threat, or once you've shrunk their Ledger Shredder, <laughs> bounce your Leyline Binding and cast it again on their bigger threat. Same with Yorian, right? I mean, it's gonna, I think it's going to be a slam dunk. Yeah, or, or against Rhinos, just killing two Rhinos. Right, because the Rhinos are just gone for good. I'm amazed by this card. So, that being said, there are some skeptics out there, right? So, we, we've, <laughs> we've been talking this card up, but there are some skeptics people who say that okay the removal in modern is already good enough with unholy heat and prismatic ending i think we've already addressed the unholy heat question prismatic ending is more of a direct comparison because they're both in white right and one of the arguments is that well ley line is not a turn one play so it's not gonna replace prismatic ending you still need your prismatic endings and then you know how many removal spells do you really need right modern decks are resilient to one for one removal so you don't want to just cram a bunch of removal into your deck and expect to win do you buy that argument, more? So, I don't... No, I don't buy the argument, mostly because I think... So, this card gets rid of literally anything on the late game, and I think that's huge against a big share of the format. And I don't think just because of Ragavan, you say you cannot kill ending. I do think this is going to be Prismatic Ending's partner in most scenarios. This is going to take the spot of something like Unholy Heat or March of the Otherworldly Lights. Yeah, I think that that's for sure. Yeah, I think it will definitely replace March of Otherworldly Lights. However, in the Delirium versions of Four Color, for example, I don't see it impossible. Like, once you're already activating Delirium, Unholy Heat is better than ending in most scenarios. So I don't see as an impossibility that in the Four Color versions of Delirium, in the Delirium versions of Four Color, you take out ending and add four of these plus the Unholy Heats, or just play a split of like three endings, three of these, four hits. And you have 10 extremely efficient, powerful removals. So you go so far as to say that it's possible that this will actually replace Prismatic Ending in some builds. I don't think that's impossible, yeah, or at least some numbers of it. Yeah, because as good as Prismatic Ending is, like I've had a bunch of games where you just like have Prismatic Ending sitting in your hand, and the opponent is dashing Ragavan or whatever, or they have a Merktide or something that you know you would love to kill it, but Prismatic Ending can't kill everything. And some things it can't kill very efficiently. I appreciate that Prismatic Ending can kill Omnath for four mana, but that's not a great play. It's not a great yeah, feeling. No. <laughs> I'm a little bit happier if I can kill Omnath for one mana at instant speed, you know, <laughs> in response to their draw card trigger before they make mana, for example. Like, I have barely gotten to kill Omnath with Ending. And, and it happens, sometimes you kill a five mana at the ferry with Ending. But you know how many times my brain has gone 5 mana defending to hold up counterspell with the plus 1 trigger and my ending just flops and having this would just be like, ha, gotcha. Yeah. So, I think that is amazing. I'm really looking forward to making some brews with it. Especially the ones that try to cheat out with, due to CMC. Exactly. Okay, so the upside is definitely there. What about the cost? Well, you have to achieve a full domain or at least four types. How far out of your way do you have to go to do that? And does that open you up to like certain weaknesses? So it does. It does increase the num it does increase the fact of how vulnerable to Blood Moon you are in the fact you are going to get triumphs in times where you could just get a basic. Like for example, in four color such situations where you could just go get an island, with this there's little upside in not getting something like a triumph of color, right? Like, let's say you're playing full color, and instead of turn five, you, instead of an island or holding up your fetch, you get an expert triumph, making sure your ley line binding is going to cost one. I think in modern, it's really easy to look this as a two mana removal, not that so in Pioneer, with the upside of being one in the late game. 
In Pioneer, I think only special decks like the Neve that's filled with Triumphs or like Enigmatic Incarnation that plays the the Tuman Enchantment that provides domain. Mm -hmm. Nilia's Blessing, I think it's the name. Nilia's Blessing, yeah, exactly. So that would literally make it a one drop. But besides that, I think the biggest change you have to you have to make to your mana is I have been criticized a lot because of that list I quickly put together that had Call of um, Colonnade. <laughs> I think David might have sent me a death threat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Immediately everyone is like, no, there's one celestial colonnade in the mana base. Off with his head. <laughs> it's a Yorion deck. I mean, it's a question, though. Apart from the specifics of Celestial Colonnade, it's a question of, like, all right, we've gotten used to building control decks a certain way. Like, let's just stick with blue-white X control in modern. We have our trusted utility lands, right? We have Mystic Gates, if we enjoy casting Archmage's Charm. We have Castle of Interest, if you are a glutton for punishment. You have <laughs> Celestial Colonnade, if you're a boomer. A boomer. Otawara, of course. I mean, that's a proven card. So these cards have all earned their slots in previous versions of the archetype. Can you afford to play them if Leyline is demanding that you have access to Triome Basic or Shock Shock in the first two turns? I think some of them you do, but for some of them you have to make small... Give, like, you have to reduce the number of them. You can still play a few of them, you just have to make sure your fetchland density is high enough. I don't think you attack the utility lands, but rather the efficiency lands, like Mystic Gate and Check lands, are the first ones to go. Yeah, Mystic Gate is the one that I have my eye on. I think that we need to cut the Archmage's Charms from Leyline decks, and related to that, I think that Shadow Prophecy is going to offer that effect an even better version of Archmage's Charm at the same mana cost. Yeah, that's pretty likely, and then just play another 2CMC counter as Drowning the Lock or Robin's Veto which likely just fills up the slot pretty nicely. So we'll get into that when we look at uh, some of these lists, but... Yeah. All right, so we've decided we like Leyline, we're going to build around it. I, I think something that's going to be pretty important is the Devil of Color Triumph. Like, let's say you're playing something like Esper Control or Sheskai Control, mostly Sheskai because it's the most common version of the deck. Just by playing one Sagoth Triumph, that's the Sultai one, you achieve five color domain by just getting that instead of an island in the mid game. So you're thinking if my primary colors are, you know, these three colors, I should include one double off color triome just so that yeah. with a single fetch land, I get the rest of my domain. Exactly. And one of those colors is going to be exactly the one you need. It's going to be of the main deck, of the main part of your deck. So if you're playing like Sheskai, which is always space blue, you play the Sultai triome. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And that's really going to help make your mana efficient while making sure you got a cheap 5-color domain in most games. Because there's not a lot of land hate in modern nowadays. Yeah, I agree. So it's not something I think you should be afraid of. All right, so we've decided that we like the ley line. We're going to build around it. Let's talk about builds, right? There's, there's kind of two ways to approach this. One is, all right, what are the existing proven known decks in modern and which ones can adopt ley line? Second, which is the approach that I think, you know, we prefer on this podcast is, all right, we'll just start from scratch. Imagine that we're, all we know is that we want Leyline Binding. Where does that lead us? But the first approach is important because this is actually going to affect the top tier meta. So let's just start with that. Which existing decks adopt Leyline? I think we're in agreement that four color Omnath gains a lot from having access to Leyline. Yeah, 100%. I think Four Color Omnath is bound to play at least three, like, immediately from the start. And that's maybe more, more, maybe less. I can make it sure, but I know it's just going to have more cards. Yeah, I think that bouncing your only land with Teferi is big game. Same blinking it with Yorian. It's just a matter of tweaking the numbers and, you know, getting that, that off-color Triumph somewhere in there. I think you can easily find it, room for it, especially in an 80-card deck. Yeah, especially because it has to be like only one color off. Like you have to add any triumph that just taps for black while you get you. So it's basically a tap shock land. Right. Or like I have seen four color. I have seen lists of four color that play as no land, the ones that enter their top, and that's literally this. So you've got a lot of experience with the Traverse the Ovenwald Delirium package in four color. Would you consider Leyline Binding like part of a Delirium package, or is this just something that's not going to end up in the graveyard ever? 
I don't think it's gonna end up end up in the graveyard consistently. I do think you just play it because the card is bound to be insane. And the only question is what do you replace with it? Like if we find this card to be a lot better than Unholy Hit and make sure Unholy Hit is not worth the hassle. Because the reason you play Mistral Bubble and such is not for Traverse. Traverse is the upside after you make sure Unholy Hit is an amazing card. Okay. So if Leyland Binding ends up taking the place of Unholy Hit, then I'm pretty sure the Traverse builds are gonna start disappear once again and Traverse back into the usual four color blink slash mid range deck lists. Just because Leyland Binding takes the place of Hit. The other way around is that we find out it's better than ending, and then we're just gonna go full on Traverse, full of four of these, four of that, and play one or two black triumphs to make sure we can consistently cast this for one CMC. Alright, so that's four color Omneth, which we predict, or I predict at least, will be five color Omneth soon. Yeah. What about uh, blue white X control? Here's a, a list where you've actually thought this through and come up with a preliminary sketch. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how Leyline Binding fits into this archetype and how you might uh, present a build. So what I think is Leyline Binding is bound to make the deck splash a tiny bit more. All of a sudden, you're going to play Leyline Binding as a 4 of, or at least you're going to try to play Leyline Binding as a 4 of. It's my first immediate side, which is bound to make your mana base a lot more sketchy than it was before. One of the powers of Asodius, or like straight up Asodius, is its mana base. However, I think the power of Leyline Binding is enough to uh, offset that and lead you into trying to make sure your mana base can cast it. And once you have done that, you have little to no reason to not add a third color of splash. Be it red, be it black, be it green. Any particular of them I think is bound to have some upside once you splash into them. But the power of playing a lot of utility lands and just efficient mana I think goes away once you start playing four Leyline Bindings, which at least I assume are worth it. Mm -hmm. So I went like, okay, if I'm gonna destroy my mana for this, I might as well destroy it for another reason, and that's why I added black to my initial versions. And that's mostly because I want to fit the other domain card from this set that I think is amazing, which is... I can't ever remember the name of this card for some... God for Shadow Prophecy! <laughs> I've got it called up here, because got... we got to talk about this card. Shadow Prophecy... Low key, one of the best cards in the set. This is the Death Rite Shaman of the set, the one that just showed up in <laughs> the final dump of cards. Two and a black instant. Look at the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of basic land types among lands you control. So this is that domain effect. Put two of those cards, or up to two of those cards rather, into your hand, the rest into your graveyard, you lose two life. Black has gotten crappy versions of this for limited for a long time, where like, yeah, you look at four, you lose two life. Those effects cost four mana. This costs three mana and looks at five cards. And it's an instant. And it's an instant. It kind of takes a minute to compute, like, how much of an upgrade is this? But, I, I mean, I'm going to make the case, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this on Monday in our kind of top five wrap-up show, that this is basically an upgraded Factor Fiction. The, the effect is more powerful than Factor Fiction. And the cost is cheaper than Factor Fiction. If this looks at 4 consistently, this is better than Factor Fiction, and it's in contingency with Memory Deluge. I think it might be better than Deluge. It's better because it puts them in your graveyard. Yeah. I mean, that's so powerful. Putting them in your graveyard is huge. Like, this card has so many things. Like, when I first look at this card, I disregarded it saying, oh, it's a sorcery. Then I read again, oh, it's an instant. Then I disregard it again saying, oh, it must have, like, some weird one to the graveyard, one to your hand. No, no, it's just your hand. And I was like, oh, and they go to the graveyard? <laughs> Why does this have so many good takes? Why is this a common? So in modern, right, we're going to be building a domain mana base. You're going to pay three mana at instant speed. You're going to look at your top five cards. Your two favorites go to your hand. The other three go to the graveyard. That's the profit zone. That's a, still a resource. What are you going to do with them in the graveyard? Well, that's up to you. So in, I think in this initial sketch, this is a pretty conservative control list to start with, which I think makes sense. Um, you don't have a ton of graveyard payoffs, but you do have... Tainted Indulgence, right, which becomes a draw two. Yeah. And, you know, Leyline provides you a six drop. So now you've got a bunch of ways to get to that, uh, what is it, five different types, five different mana costs? Yeah, you have 12 three drops, the three barracks as four drops, six five drops in the form of Solitude, which tend to go to the graveyard early, Leyline Banding, Prismatic. So if you can get like a Solitude, a Prophecy, any two drop which is bound to go, plus a land and an ending, like it's pretty easy for this deck to get that in the mid game. Transform your Indulgence into two mana draw two. Right, so the concept here makes sense, right? You're going to just be reactive, 
A lot of one from one removal, some fights on the stack, some removes permanents, some is sweepers, a bunch of card draw. I think the questions you have to answer to like hone this deck are A, what about the mana base, right? How many Yeah. Mystic Gates. Do we need to add extra fetch lands so that we have, you know, more opportunities to like achieve domain early? How many Mystic Gates, right? You've got right now both Archmage's Charm and Shadow Prophecy. I think this is a case where I would just argue for cutting the Archmage's Charms. I mean, that might happen. Like, so literally the minute we started to record, Godbots announced that the cards are already in their, in their platform. So literally this moment we end this call, I'm going to Godbots paying my 20 cents for, show, for, for Shadow Prophecy, looking for someone to steal Leyland Binding from, and firing up leagues. How much are they selling Leyland Bindings for right now? They don't have them, but they're buying them for 12, which means they're going to sell them. Like, they have sold a few already for like 13. Okay. All right. So not a stupidly expensive, but remember everybody, draft. So this is Thursday midday. Draft are starting in around an hour, and after that, all prices just start to go down bottom until they spike up again. I, I would not be surprised if Leyline is one of the... Unlicensed Hearst, Fable of a Mirror Breaker class cards, where, you know, the standard prices are a little bit weird on Magic Online. So it, it's very possible that this becomes very expensive on, online. Just make sure to get your copies if you can. I think, it, actually, it's gonna, like, 20 digs, I think it's a bit expensive. I think it's gonna go drop a lot during today, as more and more people draft and open it, because it's actually pretty pick up in draft as well, which is a good sign. So people are gonna start selling more and more. So the other question I have about your blue-white X control is you obviously, because you are you, have built this at 80 cards. And for that reason, you're playing Omen of the Seas, you're playing Wall of Omens, and Leyline Binding gives you yet another card that benefits, not as much, yeah. but benefits somewhat from being able to blink it with Yorian. You've got Teferi Time Reveler here as well, so you, know, you have a, a good amount of cards, you have Solitudes, that give you something when you sky noodle them. <laughs> However, it does mean that like you don't have as as high of a fetch land density as you maybe should have for a domain deck. Actually, I don't agree with that take. Your decks tend to have a higher fetch land density than non Yorion decks. Well, I'm just saying this this one does not have a high enough fetch land density for my comfort level. Oh yeah, but that's not because I don't have enough fetch lands. It's because I'm playing for Mysticates because I'm a greedy asshole. Right. Okay. Okay. So you're saying if if we if I can have my way, if I can cut the Archmage's charms, <laughs> I can yeah, yeah. replace the Mystic Gates with more fetch lands. I'm not sure how to cut them, but you need to trim them. Now you you can likely leave two and add like a fourth round and a, add a Dobbin's Veil or such or Tailsend, which is, has been an amazing counter spell in most scenarios, and be fine with it. That shouldn't be an issue at all. Okay, that makes sense. Just make sure to trim at least a few of them, and then like. Your index tend to have a higher fetch land density because you don't replay you don't add additional shock lands. You just add additional fetch lands once you go up in the numbers. Like it's pretty common when you look at the same deck in New in Yuri and non Yorion, the six, seven added lands, five of them are fetch lands. Right. Because why would I add a, a third Halo Fountain? Exactly. And then I made a bit of a less conservative Esper control if I can call it Esper control deck. Yeah, so this was actually the next place I wanted to go because the question I had from your first list was, all right, you have both Tainted Indulgence and Shadow Prophecy. You have a lot of ways to put something in your graveyard and not that many ways to profit off the graveyard. Is there something you could do to like turn the graveyard into more of a exciting place? And your second list, I think, is going in the right direction with Persist. Yeah, for Persist, for... So I add the Tainted Indulgence for 4, 4 Archon, 4 Persist, 4 Unmark Grave, 1 Unreal Rides because it gives you a capability of, co of filtering for an animation spell with Unmark Grave. Yeah, so my, my contention here is that Shadow Prophecy is so good that you should just cut Unmark Grave. Unmark Grave is pretty bad, especially in a deck that's trying to play Counterspell. Just rely on Shadow Prophecy instead, right? Shadow Prophecy sets up the Unmark Rides perfectly. I, th I assume that... I just didn't have what it takes to run the alpha alpha draft without Unmarked Grave. I think Unmarked Grave is going to hold you back. I mean, honestly, like you've got I a bunch of filler might. cards here. I, I would just like this. I would build the sixty cards. Like this, I don't think you benefit that much from yeah, likely. Omen of the Sea, Wall of Omens. Like you're trying to find specific persist archon packages, and a card like Unmarked Grave is kind of like bad filler, if I can say that. I don't like. I don't think. 
Uh, so you would go this down to 60. Like I can really see it going down to 60. You just stream on. I have the headlix right open. I can discuss those changes in literally a matter of seconds. So let's see. We can literally go. We got the Wall of Omens. We got the Omen of the Sea. We got a Watery Grave, an Otawara, the Four Mystic Gates. A flooded strand, a castle. Cut the unmarked graves. Cut the four unmarked graves. And we have a deck list. We have to cut an additional card. It can easily be the fourth charm. Go on to three charm because you hate it. I do hate I do hate Archmage's charm. And immediately we're looking at a list that looks really nice. So we have 24 lands, which is, I think, a reasonable amount for a deck looking to carga solitude in a lot of scenarios. Mm hmm. 12 2 mana spell, 4 counter spell, 4 persist, 4 tainted indulgence, 4 prismatic ending, 4 shadow prophecy, 3 Agnes charm, 4 solitude and 1 unburial rites, 4 leyland binding, and 4 archon of cruelty. So the curve of tainted indulgence into shadow prophecy requires you to have, assuming with shadow prophecy for 4, which I think is reasonable, requires you to have an archon of cruelty in the top 27 plus 2 plus 3 plus. The 4 is 16, which is right on the odds of that happening, right? With a place at 1 in 16 seems pretty high. And that's assuming we want to reanimate on turn 4. Right, I think it doesn't have to happen on turn 4, because you have so much spot removal between yeah. layer line bindings, prismatic endings. It's possible that once you start playing this, you know, a curving Tainted Indulgence into Shadow Prophecy is actually pretty bad, right? You've, you're you pretty far behind if you've done that. Yeah. So, like, maybe it's, like, slightly too many card draw spells, and maybe we can trim a little bit there. I don't see that as bad when you have cards like Solid and Leila in Binding to, like, fill out the curve. Like, maybe not turn 3 Shadow Prophecy, but I, I don't see as an impossibility the turn 2 Tainted Indulgence into turn 3. Prismatic Ending plus Solitude, and then you might persist as Solitude a lot of the time. Oh, that's good. Like, resisting solitude is a thing that happens a lot. That's why you play for solitudes always in this sort of deck and Spike plays Grief. Right, right. Because it's a pretty good failsafe. Just persisting that, that goes to the graveyard on its own. Yeah, it doesn't have to specifically be Archon. Exactly. Okay. It gives you a failsafe against mid-range decks, or sometimes it's a really good 2 for 1. 2-1 two Lifelinker that removes a creature is something I would pay 2 mana for any time of my day. I like the explosive potential of this deck. Um, I think I would probably play this one before the control one. Not that it's necessarily better, but it's just more fun, I think. Yeah, yeah, I just really enjoy the control legs. I really do like giving it a sort of combo finish where after going turn 3 counter, turn 3 stack interaction, turn 4 country, plus like turn 4, I don't know, Shadow Prophecy plus Leyline Binding. Sometimes on turn 5 you can just go Persist Archon hold up counter spell, and that's going to win you the game. Like that's better than any Teferi, any Chase, any whatever. Yeah. Also, post cyber, if you expect graveyard hate, you only have to cut eight cards, so it's pretty likely you can just cut like like three persist, three archon, or like any number of them, and add stack interaction, and make sure it isn't ever a problem. Also, this is likely the best Asorius deck with a matchup against Living End. And keep in mind that Leyland Binding answers any kind of permanent based graveyard hate, so you don't even yeah. need to cut all the graveyard stuff. Right, depending on what hate you think they're going to bring, right? If they're relying on Hearse, or um, I mean, even Tormod script. Yeah, you have binding plus ending. You're bound to have a lot of answers for it. You know, you'll you'll just have to play a little bit of a slower game. You'll eventually get your thing to go off with the Archon. Yeah. Also, I would cut Amburial Rides, I think, if I'm not playing Alma Right. But Shadow Prophecy, so good. <laughs> but you just put it into your hand. But it's even more powerful. I mean, this is like the gifts on given into Andoria <laughs> rights, but you do it for three mana on a card that doesn't suck. My first route of the deck that I didn't post because I knew I would get bullied for, I, I had a gifts on given. I'm just saying Shadow Prophecy is so much better than gifts. It's so much better. It is. It is. It, is. it 100% is. And since we're on the subject of Shadow Prophecy, we should at least consider the Indomitable Creativity archetype. Oh yeah, 100%. Shadow Prophecy makes a lot of sense there because, right, some of the build versions of creativity are already incorporating a, a minor reanimation package, right? Like the Grixis Archon deck plays creativity and it plays persist, right? Four persist, four indomitable creativity, and it's using cards like Prismari Command, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, you know, Collector Brutality, or who knows what you might find in there. They 
understand that like okay some of the time i'm going to creativity on my dwarf mind token to get the archon in play some of the time i'm going to dump the archon in the graveyard and persist it back it's kind of nice to have these two different angles of attack and shadow prophecy i think fits beautifully into both strategies right if, if you just shadow prophecy on turn three you get five looks to find creativity on turn four alternately you might see the archon there put that in your graveyard find a persists hmm. right maybe you found both maybe you put the creativity in your hand and put the archon in the graveyard you're just doing it all so i think it's a natural fit there to at least work in some shadow prophecies the question becomes once you've done that do you also want ley line binding I mean, that's exactly what happened to me with Asodius, right? The moment you start going down the adding domain to your pool, you're like, why not just add a tiny bit more? Exactly. Bite a bit more that you can chew all of a sudden. However, the four color versions of, like, right now we have five color Archon and four color Archon and three color Archon. So we have Archon in all shapes and flavors nowadays. Exactly. So I'm pretty sure the five color one absolutely is gonna smash for leyline bindings into the deck list. And there's no synergy there to speak of, right? It's just like this is a very powerful removal spell. <laughs> However, I think the the what's the name of it? Sorry, the Rixis versions get a huge upgrade from Shadow Prophecy and just Shadow Prophecy because you're bound to play a lot of triumphs in the early game. You don't mind just getting an enough color red triumph in the early game, like a Ketria or like. Like a band triumph to make sure you have blue plus a, sorry, it has to be red. So red red, green and white. Yeah, that's the one detail. Is as long as Indominal Creativity and Dwarven Mine are in your deck, you, you need to play only red triumphs. So you can still do it, right? You just go turn one triumph, turn two, another triumph. <laughs> turn one Naya Triumph into literally Shockland Shockland with red, like Watery Grave Steam Bands, it's fine. So the argument that I would make in favor of Leyline Binding here is that if I'm going turn one Triumph, turn two Triumph, I only have one mana available. Like, what's the best spell I can possibly cast? And that's literally Leyline Binding. Exactly. <laughs> you can go turn yeah. one Triumph, turn two Triumph, plus Leyline Binding, and just you're, you've kept up, right? You're not that far behind. Yeah, I think I just love the card. Also, I love Shadow Prophecy. I love these two domain cards together. I think, like, really power up some decks. Like, and some of them needing some power up. Little Binding sadly goes into four color, which didn't need a power up. But it does go into a lot of decks that I think really needed it. So I'm happy for that. All right. So we talked about four color Omnath. We talked about blue white control. We talked about Esper Reanimator, three to five color creativity. We haven't talked about the big one yet. And this is your favorite, Mord. Yeah. So before I'm going to make a tiny bit of introduction to that, all the decks we have discussed so far. Only make use of Leyline Binding because they twist their mana bit to have an absurd removal spell, right? Right, which is cute, but it's just a removal spell. Yeah, exactly. I'm not brewing with this. I'm just excited for it because I love playing new cards, I love changing meta, and I'm most more excited about Shadow Prophecy than I am about Leyline Binding in this text, right? Yeah, agreed. Like, the nobody piece is the prophecy. Mm -hmm. However, there's another use for Leyline Binding, which is... Not only the fact it's an enchantment, but also the fact it has a high CMC. So immediately, like the reason we learned about Leyline Binding was because I didn't read the whole TXT, but there was a particular Discord that was just drooling all over it. And that was the Dingvatic Incarnation Pioneer Discord. <laughs> Which is like the whole formats, but it's they were talking about Pioneer because I, I was like the only one, the last one brewing with Modern, and once I forsaken the, ar the archetype, it just sort of disappeared with the Lurus ban. However, Enigmatic Incarnation, for anybody that doesn't remember, and good for you, it's better not to remember what that card does, it's better for your psyche. <laughs> Format enchantment, two, a green and a blue. At the beginning of, at the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice an enchantment if you do. Fall for a creature that goes one more straight into play. Important aspects is it doesn't sacrifice as a cost, it sacrifices resolution. So you always are sure to have an enchantment for it. Second of all, it just appears into the board. And generally, um, Enigmatic works in a way where you play a bunch of Abundant Growth, Seals, Omens, Spreading Seas, and you put those into efficient 2 drops and 3 drops. The last versions were playing stuff like Shodan of the Skulls and Enigmatic, so you can get Solitude and Fury. However, 
Once you are a 6 drop in Shredder Pile that you can cast consistently on turn 2 or 3, everything changes. And quite a bit. Because now you are giving this deck a consistent way to find 7 drops on its turn 3 or 4. And that's just insane. Yeah, I mean, the deck is named after any mech incarnation, so when it comes down and starts doing its thing, you're in trouble, but I normally assume I have a few turns to fight back. That's not the case anymore if the same turn you cast any medic, you're sacrificing a 6 CMC enchantment and getting a 7 drop directly into play. What are the best 7 drops? We have mild stuff like Mir Battle Sphere, <laughs> Agent of Treachery, um, some good old Titan of Industry, or a spicy one, which is the one I found out yesterday, because I was talking about Platinum Imperium with the guys. Sorry, um, Platinum Angel. And someone all of a sudden was like, wait guys, we're all idiots. We're all forgetting about the big one. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. How I know can I you go... forget about this card? I know you're going to always have my back on that one. I didn't forget about the card. I forgot about We its... were just talking about creativity. This is a slam dunk seven drop in creativity. I forgot about its CMC. I never hard cast this card. Forgot about the Sarah Emissary. Sarah Emissary, straight to play on turn 34, is game. Against a lot of decks, it's a straight up game. <sighs> I have not played much creativity, so I, I guess I haven't had Sarah Emissary in play that many times. How certain is this? Like, is it an actual lock? Against Hammer, it's game. Against Rhinos, it's game. Because a lot of the times, you don't name their win con, you name their way out of getting away of a 7 drop. So against Rhinos, unless you're borderline dead where you just name creature, you can name instant, and now you have an unremovable 7 drop. Bone Crusher Shy and... Um, Brace and Borrower, all that stuff literally does nothing. And Sarah's Emissary closes things out very, very quickly. And Sarah's Emissary is a tutor clock. It's not like you can just outrace the Emissary a lot of the time. And if you're behind on board, you name Creature. If they have the one of Brace and Borrower, that's sad. But as long as that doesn't happen, Rhinos are useless. They can't even block your remaining creatures. And Sarah's Emissary plus a Rally or something is a tutor clock. Against Hammer Time, you name Creature and the game is over. Against Creativity, you name Creature and the game is over. Archon can't target you. That's nuts. <laughs> against Work Tide, pretty much over. Against Burn, 50%. 50% dots. Alright, so we have four Leyline Bindings, and all we need is the one Sarah Emissary. I see you've got one Titan of Industry. I guess that's just in case you draw... Your seven drop. <laughs> it might be an agent of treachery, where like in the discussion which is better. I really like the Titan into stabilize against like mid range boards. Okay. Like sometimes you're gonna be playing against something like Asorius or the Shadow where just Serra Semista is not gonna be what wins you the game, but a five but a seven seven with a shield counter plus a four four is. So you've got two different lists sketched up. You've got a modern enigmatic incarnation and a pioneer version. The Pioneer one is a somewhat known build, but the modern yeah. one, like you're saying, people kind of gave up on it after you and Davius worked on it in the beginning. Yeah. What goes into the modern and enigmatic build? Right? There's a lot of cards here that are just not legal in Pioneer. So the most important ones are stuff like spreading seas being extremely efficient in the format as a way to disrupt stuff. Seethys is just a bonkers to mana creature in place of something that they are playing. The seals really help you like keep the deck together, but it's also the fact you actually have good three drops to get, like consistently, where that doesn't happen in the other version. Sorry, two drops to get, so you can actually play one man enchantments because you have abundant growth and utopia sprawl, which doesn't happen in the uh, pioneer one. Like pioneer ones tends to get three drops and four drops, modern ones tends to get one drops, two drops, and five drops. Right, right. Pioneer very, very focused on sack the two mana enchantment and get the three mana creature. Yeah, but also quite a lot of sack the three mana one, which modern has literally zero of because there are no playable four mana creatures besides Somnath, and there are no playable three mana enchantments besides Fable. Yeah, Omnath is good, but it's not worth cluttering your deck up with three mana enchantments. Yeah, exactly, especially when you're going to get it on end step. However, I haven't tested a version of Enigmatic with Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which actually might be a slam dunk. Hmm. 
So that's something that's of course gonna see some testing. The folks in Pioneer are actually playing a main deck Agent of Treachery and a main deck Colossal Sky Turtle. It's because Colossal is actually playable if you top deck it. Hmm. And in Pioneer, a 6 5 World 2 is bound to actually be really efficient against a lot of the format. And in the sideboard, they have a Titan of Industry. That's surprising to me. I know, I know that this is just a th theoretical discussion still, but like Colossal Sky Turtle doesn't feel game winning to me. Like if I sacrifice my Leyline Binding to get any 7 drop, a 6 5 Flying Ward is not. I just. I think Titan of Industry might be the best to just fight on the mid range fight. Yeah, it doesn't... I mean, Enigmatic in, in Pioneer plays a long game, right? You can just get to 7 mana, can't you? Yeah, yeah, consistently you are. Especially with first of Invention and such, and the fact that a lot of your deck can trips. Mm -hmm. Like, it's pretty common to just get into that. Also, the other spicy pickup this deck got that I didn't that in my modern deck because I forgot is the Idler Channeler. Remind us what that card does. That's a 3 ability card. Exactly. 3 mana, 2, 1 a blue and two for a human wizard, and that's why people are already going to start to spice it up with the land whose name I can't remember because it's from your age. Oh, Riptide Laboratory. Yeah. So Riptide Laboratory, it's a 3 match 2 one human wizard. When it enters the battlefield, choose one of three. So this is like the next card in the cycle from the black one from Strixhaven. Enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one bird with flying. Bounce a non-land permanent to its opponent's hand, to its owner's hand, or draw a card. So, two amazing abilities and a mediocre one when you need a board. But I think the most important one is the Reflector Maces part of it. Bounce any non-land permanent to its owner's hand, it's insane. Hmm. So that can target your own stuff, you can target your own enchantments if you want to. I think so. I was out to say exactly that. Yeah, and that's sort of bonkers when you start considering stuff like Navan, and this can go semi-infinite. Just bounce this on itself. Oh no, it's another. Oh. Hmm. Oh. So are you considering the Ether Channeler for the modern build or the Pioneer build, or both? In the Pioneer build, it's already in. In the modern build, I think you want one, because a lot of the time, you're in the indecision if you should play something like a Reflector Mage, but the problem is drawing Reflector Mage sucks. Right. Same with Deputy Detention. It's, it's not a very impressive card. However, this having the failsafe of a 2-1 ETB draw card, or at least make a 2-creature board, is a lot better upside of top decking Reflector Mage against Asorius. Like, it's not even close. Yeah. So just to paint a picture of like what's in the modern builds, right? Your, your enchantments are the ones that are a lot of four ofs. You got a bunch of enchantments, then all the creatures are one ofs. So in enchantments, you have a bunch of one CMC. You have Seal of Fire, Abundant Growth, Utopia Sprawl. A bunch of two CMC. You have Spreading Seas, Omen of the Sea, a couple Dress Downs. At four CMC, four Enigmatic, four Showdown of the Scalds, a card that, you know, Mord, you've had a ton of success with, works with your Solitudes and Furies. And then Leyline Bindings, which is kind of the pseudo one drop, but also unlocks that seven mana creature. Then the rest of the deck is a bunch of one ofs, and here we're, we're looking at cr creatures that Pioneer does not have access to. There's the one Sithis, there's the one Meddling Mage, so that you can sack your Abundant Growth to get a lock piece there. Sanctifier and Vec, is that worth a min deck slot? It depends on the meta. Yeah. Charming Prince, I see you have a spirited companion here, the little good boy. At three mana, you have your value and your removal. Right? Removal in the form of yeah. Skyclave Apparition. You have Magus of the Moon for the surprise lockdown. Eternal Witness and Renegade Rallyers for value. And then at five mana, and these are pseudo five mana, you have Solitude and Fury. Your seven drops, Titan of Industry, Sarah Emissary. This could easily change a lot, especially if I start fiddling with... So, Ertai is a new card that's actually a pretty decent four drop. It is, but then I mean, you don't have you don't have the three mana enchantments. I mean that, that no, yeah. it's easy if I add for fables for playtesting because fable is likely the best enchantment in this deck besides Abuna Growth and Utopia Sprawl. All right, well let's hold that in our mind because we can look at the Pioneer build now, which you've also prepared yeah. for us, and that one does play fable. So in Pioneer, Enigmatic is a deck you will occasionally run up against. It's it's pretty good, not great, but it's pretty good. Again, 80-card deck, because Yorian plays beautifully with these kind of toolbox strategies. We don't have any of the one-mana enchantments that we had in Modern, right? In fact, the only one-mana enchantment that routinely sees play is Chained to the Rocks. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, I mean, 
I guess, is there anything else? Not really. No, you have a bridal growth, which is like abundant growth, but it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so Chain to the Rocks, I mean, in a weird way, Chain to the Rocks already prepares your mana base for Leyline Binding because Chain to the Rocks requiring exactly a mountain is not that easy to do without fetch lands. So you find that Enigmatic Incarnation already plays like a lot of shocks and triumphs that happen to have, you know, certain land types. It was borderline ready for this. So we can easily add four Leyline Bindings here. Right, so now we just have like cheap removal. We could do that exact same trick. Sack your Leyline Binding, get a seven drop. Titan of Industry comes to mind. You mentioned Agent of Treachery. Colossal Sky Turtle, I see you've put one of those in here as well. Yeah, this is not my deck list. This was taken for the Nematic Dig Score by NJMTG, which is the guy that has been focusing on Pioneer since the start. And he posted three deck lists. Kitty! Oh my gosh. <laughs> is that uh, NJ63 right now? <laughs> who, was, who was actually yeah, a cat? Who is actually a, a tiny cat? Yeah. He actually prepared three versions of the deck. In Magic in Pioneer has like three common versions, which is I assume everybody that plays against the deck has no idea this actually exists. This is actually only for us. It's like the people in the four color shenanigans that actually differentiate from mid range, blink, and traverse. For everybody else, it's the same. Mm -hmm. For us, it's our own little niche, and it's particularly different. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the four color, five color, and six color versions of the deck. Six color versions? What is a six color version? You don't want to talk about the six. We don't talk about the six color version. The six color version is El Rasi Displacer plus Six Rhino. Oh my god. It's the Burn Enigmatic. I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> I told you not to ask. It's the one that has the most lately, the most five O's lately as well. I need to un unhear what I just heard. All right, let's. So the, the, the deck literally wins by getting. Like, I'm just going to show you the screenshot and you're going to want to drop magic forever and it's going to be wise of you to do so. I'm going to place this here. Right below the deck list, just so you can cry. Because you asked. I told you not to ask. Alright, so I see about six Fable of the Mirror Breaker tokens in play. Kenrith is yes. activating to give everything... Or actually, to, to reanimate a Siege Rhino. A, a Siege Rhino? Or the fourth Siege Rhino on the battlefield? Oh my gosh, I didn't see that. Okay, so there's three Siege Rhinos already in play. Fires of Invention and two Enigmatic Incarnations. <laughs> Opponent is playing Turbo Fog, and it's about to die to the fourth Rhino returning trigger. As you can see, the mana base plays a bunch of painlands in order to enable Eldrassi Displacer. So we're definitely not going to have painlands and Leyline Binding in the same deck. I mean, the six color version is that they're testing does, but that's because they're insane. You can be a bit more greedy here because you're playing the four Nylia's Blessing, Nylia's Presence. So that card, correct me if I'm wrong, but that card was not previously part of any Enigmatic Incarnation. Oh, it was, it was. It has always been a playset. Always been a playset. It all has, I mean, at least for the last couple of months, it has been a playset. Like, that was not a new addition to support binding. Hmm. It has been a very bad, because it's two mana wound and growth, and you sort of need that, because it also allows you to cast um, Change to the Rocks, even if you have, like, um, a Godless Shrine and a Temple Garden. I see. So it's not amazing, but it has been a part of the deck forever, and it's a, likely one of the best two-man enchantments you can find in Pioneer. So when they added the binding, it was like, okay, sometimes it might be a two-card combo, but even if you have a crappy mana base, you can get it for one mana a lot of the time. So there's actually fewer enchantments in this build than one might expect. There's only seven, and they're all playsets. There's Nydia's Presence, Omen of the Seas, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Fires of Invention, Enigmatic Incarnation, Leyline Binding, Chain to the Rocks. The rest of the deck is all one of creatures, and it's a different creature suite than in Modern because you're sacrificing at different points on the curve, right? So you're sacrificing yeah. a lot of twos to get threes. Because of Fable, you can sack a three to get a four. Because you have potentially extra copies of Fires of Invention, you have actually some incentive to put five drops in your deck now. So there's cards like Kenrith. I see a Yorian in the main deck here. And because of Leyline Binding, we now need to find room for a couple seven drops. But if we look at the one-off creature suite, uh, there's a bunch of new ones here, a bunch of new ones from Dominaria. I th yeah, my favorite one has to be the Serra's... I can't ever remember. Serra's Paragon. Serra Paragon. So, so Lurus got the band hammer and it was like an essential part of this deck. So they said, what if we had an expensive Lurus? 
Also here I posted right below the six color version so you can see it and cry later. Just because of the name. Yeah, God. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. So Serra Paragon, amazing at the fact it works exactly the same as Lurus where you can get the card back on end step. So let's say you sacrifice a Nomen or an Ilias presence or sorry, a Nomen or whatever with Flash during the mid game. And then you got, with the Serra Paragon, you can get it back immediately to turn it enters the battlefield. Or a Leyline Binding. Oh no, sorry, no Leyline Binding. No, yeah, you can get back a Leyline Binding. Am I wrong? I think you can get back anything, right? Let me see. I'm trying to remember the text on the card. It might be three or less. I think it's just any permanent. No, no, it's three or less. It's three or less. Oh, okay. So you can get back immediately a Nomen of the Seas, and if it doesn't die, you can get back the Fable. But it has an interesting synergy with Fable, where due to Fable exiling itself, it loses the exile itself trigger if it transforms into a creature. Oh, that's cute. Exactly, and it also works. Something similar happens with the 2 mana 3 1 that you sacrifice to destroy an artifact or enchantment. Cathar. Cathar Commando, yeah. Yeah, because it's a trigger ability in the Paragon. If you sacrifice the, the Cathar Command on, on your turn and recast it in response to the Exile trigger, you just nullify it. Interesting. So you actually have a chance to respond to Sarah Paragon's Exile Clause. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So yeah, you have that. You have Gloom Shrieker, which is what if we made Eternal Witness but bad? 2-1 Menace, Enchantment Creature, only gets back permanence. And it excites itself. The Ether Channeler is in here. That's the one we talked about with the choice exactly. of three triggers. Uh, there's Zur Eternal Schemer. Very interesting synergy here with A-Line Binding. I was going to ask you about this separately, but... Yeah, it's just a 6-6 six, six Hexproof. I mean, the new Zur is not super good, but he gives all of your enchantment creatures Hexproof, Death Touch, and Lifelink. And then if you pay two mana... You can turn any non-aura enchantment into an enchantment creature with power and toughness equal to its mana cost. So I think what's really important is the fact that even if Sur dies, the effect remains. So in a lot of boards against aggressive decks, like in the mid game, it works as a sort of mana sink where you have like four fights per mana, you get a Sur and you transform a fire and invention and a, fa and a fable or enigmatic into a four four and a three three. With lifelink and hexproof and death touch. <laughs> As long as Sur is alive, yeah, but then even if Sur dies, you still get to keep a 4-4 and a 3-3 and your opponent force a removal on it. Correct. Because if they don't use a removal, you're just going to win with the 4-4 death that's like lifelink hexproof and the 3-3 with the same amount of text. So it's a good way to stabilize a board all of a sudden. Transform a Nomen and an Ilias into a 2-2 with lifelink is bound to a lot of the time be good enough against mono rare. I also suspect that when they were designing the set, like the reason they pushed Leyline Binding is partly because of Zur. They, they need to have something yeah. for Zur to do. And Leyline Binding is just like such an obvious, powerful yeah. combo. It's insanely powerful. Yeah, and just making a 6-6. Six, six. So I'm intrigued by, I mean, I hope the one of Zur performs here. I'm also wondering if there's like some other deck we could build that had that featured the Zur plus Leyline Binding combo no, more. I, ho I hope, I hope you're not talking me into i think what you're gonna talk me into i'm not sure yet what do you think i want to talk you into <laughs> anthony stuff i play bad deck stuff oh no 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 let's not talk about that no that's <laughs> okay that's okay no okay. you're ready <laughs> let's not talk about that abomination but i mean it's, it's an in interaction to keep an eye on yeah i mean i think during the preview i said that zora was not going to be good because it just asks for too much mana but Leyline is so cheap, right? You only have to activate it once to get your value out of Zur. That, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there might be something here. I agree. Just making a 6 is that's really hard to kill for a lot of decks. It's pretty important. Like, outside of Terminate, how do you even kill a Leyline binding as a 6 6 in Pioneer? It's just coming for your head. Exactly. All right, so that's two versions of Enigmatic Incarnation. Probably the yeah. best archetype where Leyline binding is not only a great removal spell, but just. An amazing card. Opens up entirely new horizons. It's just an entirely new angle of attack. Yeah. In the same vein, we have David doing something really similar. Yeah, so we're going to close out this episode with some worse decks. Right? We've been talking about good decks so far. But 
there's a lot you can do with ley line binding. Um, I'm interested in the domain strategy in general. There's like weird synergies you can do. Zur is not even the worst synergy. The worst synergy with ley line binding is... <laughs> it's the worst card we have mentioned today. ...is In Search of Greatness, a card that has cost us many, many tickets. <laughs> and David being David, you know, he immediately... He kind of like... These, these cards, he doesn't want to give up, right? We've been burned so many times by In Search of Greatness. We're like moths to a flame. We just keep coming back, <laughs> getting burned again. <laughs> Why would you want to play In Search of Greatness and Leyline Binding together? Well, In Search of Greatness costs two mana, and then on your next upkeep, you get to do something cool. We've discovered in the past that having flash effects is a really nice way to like make the timing more friendly. So what you want to do is you want to start on a Triome, turn to play either a basic or a shock, cast your In Search of Greatness. Now it's turn three. In Search of Greatness trigger goes onto the stack. You can respond to that trigger by flashing in a Leyline Binding. Remove a permanent, that's great. Now in Search of Greatness, trigger resolves, checks what's my highest mana cost. Well, it turns out I have a six mana cost in play. Now I get to put for free anything CMC7 from my hand into play. And David had to, again, do the same search that enigmatic players did. What's the best seven drop? In this case, Titan of Industry, because unlike an enigmatic, you actually have to play a bunch of them in your deck if you want to like actually have it in hand for the In Search of Greatness. Why is this card so bad? Why is it so why? bad? Uh, I mean... <laughs> that's why? a separate question. Why is, why is In Search of Greatness so bad? This is a dream, right? The dream, hope, kindles, eternal. <laughs> Wait, did this happen in your country as well, where people were talking about this card being insane? In Search of Greatness? Yeah, like, I remember in the Facebook group here in Argentina, there were people saying this is going to get banned, and was just going to crack, and I was like, has anybody read this card? People missed high on In Search of Greatness, that's for sure. We've established, okay, okay. we've well established that the card is quite poor. I mean, the biggest problem is that, like, the second copy really sucks, and if you want to build around this card, you have to put a bunch of them in your deck. Yeah. But that, nevertheless, I mean, David has sketched out a, a couple different builds here. We'll include them in the show notes. You can probably find the link in the episode description. There's a Naya version and a Bant version. Uh, I'll just sort of give the gist of what's in them. We have four In Search of Greatness, four Wolf Willow Haven, and four Nightly's Presence. The Nightly's Presence does the same function as in the Antimatic deck. It, it gets you to full domains for your Leyline yeah. Bindings. Fable of the Mirror Breaker, four copies, four Asikas Chariots, four Titan of Industry, because you really have to, you know, you have to give yourself a chance to draw the seven drop that six into seven line but i mean the fact that in search of greatness requires you to have these cards in hand is just so much more complicated now so now like the reason we have all these three drops is because you know we're gonna go two into three a bunch of the time right so yeah. you gotta have three drops so you have four fables two copies of weather seed treaty that's a new one from dominaria then you have to go three into four right next turn you'll go three into four so we have four seekers chariot and then what about four into five well luca copper coat outcast is a, a way to get a useful five drop because we actually haven't mentioned any creatures yet, we can actually use Luca to get the Titan into play. So now we have another way to make use of the Titans. And finally, uh, four portable holes and a chain to the rocks. I mean, it, it's a very speculative deck, but you can kind of see how we're meeting the requirements of Leyline, trying to make use of the Titans we had to put in the deck. Uh, it could work. It could work. Hmm. I... I, I... Uh, it could work, but even if I see a Search for Greatness deck work, I'm 99% sure the biggest mistake was putting Search for Greatness in that deck. Yeah, I mean, In Search of Greatness is awful. The Bant version he sketched out actually is a hybrid of Endematic Incarnation and In Search of Greatness, where he, David has correctly identified that the best thing you can do with In Search of Greatness is sacrifice it and get rid of it. <laughs> Trade yes. it for something better. <laughs> in this case, uh, he's got some Moonblast Clerics here card that tutors for enigmatic two either channelers renegade rally or glass pull mimic etc etc um we'll put these links in here I, I don't know if i have high hopes for these builds but as as far as brews go i appreciate that they're trying to make use of the unique properties of leyline binding as a six drop yeah with flash no less for the in search of greatness line yeah and even then you would need to have gone turn one try your, like even if you get turn th like let's say everything goes perfectly Turn three, you're able to get a... So in order for you to be able to get a turn three, seven drop into play, you will need to have gone... Is it just for greatness double green? 
It is. Green, green, yeah. So you would need to have gone turn one Trium, turn two Shockland with green, that one of its colors is not any of the other. So something like Ketri and shoot Temple Garden. And even then, you still have to use your two mana to cast the Binding on Upkeep. I think that's fine. I think that's fine. TBH. <laughs> No, We're no, not the using a mana is, for anything else, right? So we might as well flash in a Leyland Binding for but two. But the problem is they need to have they need to be extremely specific two lands. Like, Thumping Ground plus Ketra Trium does not work. True. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit awkward. Like, in Modern, I can see that mana working. Oh, maybe we need to play in Search of Greenness in Modern, then. Stop right there. <laughs> Stop right there. I've, I've done it. <laughs> I've, I lost a lot of tickets that way. But all right, maybe the less said about those two decks, the better. To close things out, I'll just mention a couple of the strategies that I'm kicking around in my head right now that I may test. And these are going back to modern where, you know, the domain mana base is a little bit easier to achieve. First question is, is there like a generic domain mid-range deck, right? If we're just looking for cards that have domain on them, we have Leyland Binding, we like that a lot. We have Shadow Prophecy, yeah. uh, I think Mord and I both like that. And we have the MH2 cards, Sign of Draco and Territorial Kavu, where they push Domain pretty hard. So between those cards, those are like 12 to 16 cards, depending on how you feel about Shadow Prophecy, that are just legitimately good. Surround them with whatever you want, right? Like, is this just going to be a generic Domain midrange deck? And we've seen people try this with things like... Um, like General Ferris, for example, and, you know, Shardless Agent, Bloodbraid Elf. Some people play it like a little quicker zoo style with Ragavans. These are all cards you could surround the core with. I'm not sure, like, which is the right way to go. I feel like if I have Ley Lines and Shadow Prophecies, I'm maybe going to play a little bit slower, play more like a mid-range Jund slash Niv style deck. What do you think about this, Mord? I hope to, I hope we see some play. Like, I really hope this can push the Arcadia bike into the light. Because this becomes extremely efficient cards. I don't know about Lanowar Green Widow. <laughs> I like Lanowar Green Widow as just like a card to dump for value off Shadow Prophecy. I mean, you you get to use it twice. This is a two and a green, four, three, trample, reach, spider. And then its domain ability is that it comes back from the graveyard for a bunch of mana. For three mana at instant speed. The instant speed is the main draw. Yeah. I was discussing this with a few with a few of my friends, and we realized that the Cascade version of Sue had a huge problem, where a lot of the time you would Cascade into some terrible spells like Helix or Bolt, and Binding solves half of those issues alongside Prophecy. Yeah. Like, making sure whatever you hit is at least... Like, a- avoiding hitting stuff like Binding when you don't want it, and just having stuff like Shadow Prophecy to increase the power of your of your Bloodbraid Elf Cascade seems extremely important. And the curve of turn one Dragavan, turn two Kabu, turn three Sign of Draco plus Binding can just be devastating. Yeah, so it's like a it's a low synergy concept, right? There's no interactions between these cards that really do anything, but they're all just like above rate cards. So is that going to be good enough? I, we'll see. Enchantress is another archetype that, oh, okay, we like Leyland Binding. We think it's very powerful. It's an enchantment. Should we accommodate that? If someone will try it. And I think the last one that, you know, we will, I will at least try because it's our monthly project is Resurgent Belief. Resurgent Belief is the replenish effect that is a zero mana effect. Leyline Binding does two important things. One, it raises the overall card quality of the deck and Resurgent Belief was sorely lacking in that respect. <laughs> like, yeah. The, the cards you have to use to fill out the deck are pretty below power. So being able to like upgrade that immediately with four good cards makes a big difference. And secondly, I mean, we said this at the beginning, Resurgent Belief, you know, it's like a bad living end. You're going to be vulnerable to graveyard hate. I don't want to have to side out of the graveyard stuff every game. So if Leyline Binding gives me a, a main deck strong four of way to answer cards like Unlicensed Hearst or whatever so that I can keep the dream of Resurgent Belief alive, I think that's going to make a big difference. Also, Leyline Binding sneakily making Shark Typhoon a lot better? Oh, okay. One so mana six... get a 6-6? Six, six? Yeah! Alright, so, I mean, yeah, I've got like an initial sketch here. It's four Leyline Binding, four Shark Typhoon. Sneaky, sneaky upgrade. For Colossal Sky Turtle, because I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think you're right that that is decent enough. 
Um, so those are like my big cards are going to return when Research and Belief goes off. Beyond that, Fable of the Mirror Breaker to fill my graveyard and provide generic value. Shadow Prophecy, because I'm playing the domain mana base, I mean, this fills the graveyard. It digs for my Resurgent Belief pieces and fills the graveyard. So I think Shadow Prophecy makes a lot of sense. I've got four of that here. Two Temporary Lockdown. This is a card we haven't mentioned yet today, but this is another very, very strong effect. I think you can play two main, two side. Uh, in some matchups, this is an amazing sweeper, right? It's one white, white enchantment, exiles everything, non-land, CMC two or less until temporary lockdown leaves the battlefield. Hmm. The question becomes like, okay, what am I doing with Resurgent and Belief? Am I actually just suspending it and waiting, or am I trying to do something like As Foretold? And in this build, I'm I'm borrowing Emmy's technology and just using three Bring to Lights uh, to to search for this Resurgent Belief on the gamble that it's it's still worth five mana. Yeah, because I have Bring to Lights, right? Three Bring to Light. I'll play one Valky. I'll play two Resurgent Belief. I don't need to draw it that often. Uh, a couple lay claims three Teferi Time Revelers, a couple cast outs, and 24 lands. So that's kind of my, my rough sketch. I don't know. What do you think about this? I mean... I like it. I actually think Shadow Prophecy is insane in this build. Just because how it feels... Like, this is the bigger use of Shadow Prophecy over stuff like Delu. Just filling up your graveyard with random stuff, right? Because in the case of the Esper deck, I don't love it as much because you need... For it to be like a 3 for one you need it to hit, like, an Archon specifically. Yeah. But here, literally hitting anything that goes into the graveyard, any enchantment is just straight up upside. Yeah. So it does so efficiently well. Agreed. So I will report back on that as we wrap up our Resurgent Belief project, uh, I think probably next week. Yeah, and we will likely have some testing by following week, taking into account the cards are already being obtained. So really excited to get some leaks going. Yeah, this is a very exciting time. The cards are getting available to play on Magic Online right now. So I think yeah, by next week, we'll have some testing results. And of course, a new set of cards to brew around. But we should leave it there for now. I think we've gushed about Leyline Binding long enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to go out and prove it. Yeah. We're going to have to prove to prove our points. So yeah, hope everybody enjoyed. And cool to see you casting some bindings. And everybody that got them for two bucks owes me a Leyline Binding. I'll save a playset for you, Mord. Actually, I, do, I did buy two playsets this time. So. Yay! It's already up to like seven bucks, so it has already gone up. Good old binding. All right, Emmy. Good luck in the queues today, and we'll see you on Monday. Thanks, man. See everybody. Bye-bye! Decklist for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in on Monday for our Top 5 Recap. The overrated, the underrated, and the most impactful cards from Dominaria United. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.